welcome you all for today's didactic today's topic is psychological first aid for women facing violence let's first discuss the learning objectives for the didactic we will talk about what is psychological first aid which is commonly known as pfa in short we will discuss about when where and to whom do we deliver pfa why do we need to do pfa we'll also talk about lives model which is the process of delivering pfa how do we do pfa that is in details we'll discuss the process of pfa and lastly we'll talk about briefly about the do's and don'ts of pfa so psychological first aid or pfa is a human approach meaning that it is a approach or an intervention which will have a lot of compassion and empathy or a supportive in nature it has to be practical assistance and it will be delivered to people who have recently suffered a serious stressor or a trauma or going through a crisis etc so these can be like maybe a natural disaster it can be an accident rape assault any kind of violence etc now so basically psychological first aid is a practical assistance what we spoke it has to be supportive in nature and it has to be crisis intervention because it is given to people who have come up met a major trauma or are undergoing a severe crisis so that's why the intervention has to be supportive in nature also important to keep in mind that it has to be non intrusive and non judgmental something we will talk a lot in detail after this we'll discuss the main goals of pfa so why do we have to go, do pfa what are the main goals of it number one is we have to assess the needs and concerns of the person second goal of pfa is ensuring the safety and stability for the person who to whom we are delivering pfa mobilizing support for that person listening to the person attentively comforting the person and validating her emotions we'll talk about the principles of pfa number one principle of pfa is we have to respect the safety dignity and rights of the women who have met a violent act assault rape or is experiencing intimate partner violence etc and has come to us for intervention or for help and we are delivering pfa so in that case we have to keep in mind that we have to respect their her safety dignity and the rights second is we have to adapt to the need and take in account of the person's culture we have to also be aware of the other emergency response measures that may be necessary for example if the woman has some medical needs or has a uh, there's a need for any legal aid then we have to be aware of those emergency response uh, resources and the measures and we should be able to guide the person through the process lastly it's also very important to note here that in pfa while we are doing a crisis intervention for uh, the person who has experienced a major trauma or violence or stress we also need to same time at the same time we also need to look after ourselves and practice self care what is not pfa pfa is not a typical professional counseling it is a crisis intervention so here we will be focusing only on the crisis and helping the person deal with the crisis situation rather than using other counseling strategies it is not a psychological debriefing process psychological debriefing is it's a technique or a strategy which is usually done over a single session and immediately after the trauma where the person who has experienced the trauma is asked to rework or narrate the incident or the experience and that reworking the aim of that is that reworking will help in the person to prevent the further development of any kind of morbidity or any kind of disorder but pfa is not a psychological debriefing so here we will never ask the person to narrate to discuss to analyze to explain what the incident or the experience was that is the sec third point that is we will not ask the person 
to analyze or explain the experience and also not pressurize people to tell their story. So who will be uh, receiving PFA? PFA will be given to any individual who have recently experienced a crisis and are experiencing distress. It will be given or it can be given anywhere that is safe, but ideally it would be better if it is done in a situation where there's a good amount of privacy provided. And when we talk about when do we deliver PFA, it is delivered to a person in distress. So usually immediately following a crisis event. The, the, the immediacy is very important here. The earlier it's given, the better it is. Now, here we have, we'll talk about why to do PFA. So when we talk about why to do PFA, we'll have to talk about a little bit about the brain, human brain. Now, if we can see here, there is a red part in the, the brain, the picture of the brain. If we can see here, there's a portion marked in red. This portion is known as amygdala. While this part where it is labeled here with an arrow, this is the prefrontal cortex. So this amygdala is the part of the brain which is uh, responsible for different emotional reactions in us. Like whenever we are feeling different types of emotions, emotional experiences, emotional reactions, this is the part which is activated. And this is the part that which is known as the prefrontal cortex. This part is responsible for various kinds of logical thinking, reasoning, decision-making, problem-solving, etc. So basically, this is the part which is responsible for logical uh, thinking. This is the part which is responsible for emotional thinking. That is called amygdala. Now, what happens is when a person experiences a major trauma, like a violence, assault, then this amygdala, the part which is responsible for emotional thinking, gets highly activated while this part, which is the prefrontal cortex, gets deactivated. Therefore, as a result, what happens is the individual is not able to think in a very logical manner. Rather, the person is thinking in an emotional manner. So now we'll talk about what are the various emotional reactions that happens as a result of trauma, maybe like violence. Here we'll be talking about violence against women. So the first thing that can ha have is we can see is fight. So this uh, together, these are all called four Fs. The first F of, of four Fs is fight. Fight is a reaction where the person is trying to verbally or physically stop or prevent or protect herself from the violence or any kind of trauma happening, assault happening to her. Flight is when the person tries to escape from that situation. So either leaving the situation like that uh, properly or mentally checking out whether there is any chance or scope of uh, this person experiencing violence or assault or anything further. Third one is fear or freezing reaction that we see. So what happens is uh, sometimes when the person experiences a particular type of trauma, maybe in this case, we'll talk about sexual assault, then what happens is uh, the person it becomes so numb or is in such a scared state, feels so threatened that the person is in, unable to speak or continue doing whatever the activity the person is doing. It seems like the person has become like a statue. Lastly, the fourth reaction is fawn. So this is a type of re response where the person who is experiencing the assault maybe then attempts to seek support or safety from the perpetrator or from the person who is assaulting her or is abusing her. So these are the four F's of fear and stress. And after a particular trauma, violence, assault, rape, etc., a woman is likely to experience these kind of reactions and that is why when we have to deliver psychological first aid, which will help the person deal with the freezing response or fear response or fawning response, etc. Now we'll talk about the lives model. So the lives model is the most uh, popular model of PFA 
This model was given by World Health Organization. Now, LIVES, the term LIVES, it's an acronym or it's a short form where each alphabet stands for a different meaning. So L of LIVES stands for listening. I stands for inquiring about the needs and concerns of the person. V stands for validating the emotions and thoughts of the person. E stands for ensuring safety of the person. And lastly, S stands for social support. Now we'll talk about each one of them in detail. So let's start with L, that is listening. So how do we listen to a person? when we are delivering PFA or what do we say to the person? Firstly, we have to keep in mind that we have to be very patient and calm. We will let her know that we are listening to her. So, for example, we can nod our head or maybe say, hmm, or at times say like, okay, I understand, etc. We have to acknowledge that how she is feeling. We have to make her understand that we are listening and acknowledging her feeling. We'll have to keep in mind that when the person, when the woman is sharing or discussing with us, we will not watch, uh, check our watch or check our phone or receive a phone call, etc. Because this person who is sharing her experience with us or whatever details she is giving us, she has experienced a major trauma and it must be very difficult for her to go through all of that and discuss that with us. So in, so as a result of that, we need to give our entire attention and full attention to this person so that she feels comfortable and fe feels that we are interested in listening and helping. While listening, we have to keep in mind that we will not judge the person. We can all have our own personal opinions and judgments and biases, but we have to keep in mind that while delivering PFA, we will not let our personal opinions or biases come in the way. So we will not say statements like, you shouldn't feel that way, or you should feel lucky that you survived, or say statements like, who are you? We will not say these statements. We will give her the opportunity to say what she wants. So therefore, we'll ask her maybe like, how can we help you? We will have to always encourage her to keep talking, but never pressurizing the person as well. So we'll ask her questions like, would you like to tell me more about it? We'll keep in mind that whatever clarification or whatever information we need, we will ask her in a calm way. We'll not pressurize her to speak anything, but at the same time, we have to keep in mind that we'll not assume things for her, that what is best for her. If I think as my opinion that this person uh, probably needs to take legal help. That's my personal opinion. I will never share that with her. I will just give her the alternatives probably and she will have to choose from whatever she wants to do. Will not interrupt her and will wait until she has finished before asking questions. Okay. So we have to allow for pauses and silence. So while narrating or while discussing, if there is a pause and we know that she's not speaking, we can't interrupt and try to speak in between. We'll let her finish her statement. And for that, we'll give her time. So we'll talk about what are the, we'll quickly revise what are the do's and don'ts of listening and speaking with trauma survivor. The do's include allow for silence. Second would be, Stay focused on her experience and on offering support. And lastly, acknowledge what she wants and respect her wishes and not assume that what is best for her. Don'ts would include that don't try to finish her thoughts for her even though there is a pause or a silence in between. Let her finish. Don't tell her about someone else's story or talk about their own troubles. And don't think you and act as if you must solve all her problems for her. You will do your part by being supportive, by giving practical assistance, by being empathetic and compassionate. However, will not try to solve problems for her. Next, we'll talk about the I part of life's model, that is inquiring about the needs and concerns. So it's very important to keep in mind how we phrase our questions. The questions has to be frame, framed in such a way 
that it is goes as an invitation for the person to speak or it is encouraging the person to speak so we can ask like what would you like to talk about or would you like to talk about your needs or would you like to talk about this a little more we have to keep in mind to ask open ended questions for example if we ask the person uh, this must be making you very sad or are you feeling sad to that question the answer will either be in yes or no but instead of that we should be asking questions like how do you feel about that so if the poll question is how do you feel about that the person will be most likely describing their feeling instead of me giving the feeling and asking if she is feeling that way or not so we'll have to ask open ended questions we have to keep checking our understanding so we have to rephrase and summarize what she has said and that will serve two purpose number one is that will help us check our understanding whether we have understood what the person has said secondly if there is something misunderstanding if there is a gap in the understanding then that can get clarified the second purpose that this will serve is when we are rephrasing and summarizing and telling it to her she will understand that i was paying attention and i'm interested to understand her point so that is another important thing we'll do next is validating and reflecting her feelings so we have to say statements like we'll make statements like it sounds as if you're feeling angry about that as if we are validating her emotions her thoughts we will explore as needed we won't ask anything that is not required for our crisis intervention or psychological first aid so we'll ask only relevant things and we can ask things like could you tell more about that if something that is something that we need to know and we'll ask for clarification every time we need it instead of assuming things next we'll talk about the v of lives matter that is validate so this we spoke about in the previous slide also how we have to reflect and validate her feelings and emotion uh, thoughts the same thing we'll talk about here but with some examples that these statements we can use to validate her emotions and thoughts so we can make statements like it's not your fault you are not to blame or it's okay to talk i know it's very difficult for you to talk but you can take your time and if you want you it's okay to talk you can say help is available but we'll only say if that actually for true because if there is a situation where we know that there is no, nothing we can do then it's we will not give such uh, wrong affirmations that we can provide help we can say statements like what happened to you has no justification or excuse or your life your health are of great value or uh, everybody deserves to be to feel safe at their home so how you are feeling i can understand it must must be very painful or i'm worried that this may be affecting your health so these are statements that will make the person feel that okay how i'm feeling is being understood uh, the person is thinks that my feelings my thoughts are genuine and are being reflected upon next we'll talk about the e of lives model that is ensuring and enhancing safety so we have to assess safety particularly after sexual assault or if episode of intimate partner violence so we'll have to assess the immediate risk of partner violence so whether if the person has come uh, the woman has come for seeking help we have to ensure that while when after the person goes back home is there a chance of immediate uh injury or violence we have to take make sure about that if it is not safe then we have to make a safety plan how do we make a safety plan we can make reference reference like we can refer the person to certain shelter homes we can refer the person to safe housing or maybe to the osc center if emergency number of the osc or support groups etc we also have to identify a safe place that may be uh useful or easy for the person to visit when the person is experiencing a lot of violence so there we can uh, suggest that can be a place of a friend that can be a family members house that can be a neighbors house but we have to identify a safe place that can also be a one stop center 
will also help the woman make a safety bag now how do we make a safety bag so here she has to take a bag where she'll keep certain important in uh, materials or things that will be useful for her to leave the house or escape from there if the, her safety is compromised so what can we have in that safety bag we definitely need to keep certain important identification documents like maybe the aadhar card voter id card etc we can have certain important medicines little bit of fru- uh, food little water uh, maybe basic clothing if the woman is uh, wants to leave the house with a child then um, maybe medicines or baby food for the child etc and some important numbers maybe the, if the woman has a mobile the char- charger etc so a bag will be prepared and wherever the woman needs it she can take the bag and leave from there when there is a lot of violence happening in that place that way we can ensure the safety of the woman now it, here it's very important to note that when the woman is escaping with the safety bag before that the safety bag has to be kept in such a place which is safe and unsuspecting so that other members in the family or other people don't find out that the bag is kept there so she can keep it in a place which only she has access to or she can leave it at a friend's place or a neighbor's place and she can leave alone and then collect the bag from that friend's place or somewhere as someone else's place when she has to leave so it is important to prepare a safety bag but at the same time it's also very important to make sure that where and how the safety bag is kept because that may again be another cause of violence that the woman faces if the bag is found out we have to be very cautious about few things that is we will talk about the abuse or assault or intimate partner violence or anything only when the survivor is alone with you or us will maintain confidentiality of everything that we make note of during the session we'll discuss how she can explain where she has been when asked at home like for, from the center when she is going back uh, and she is being asked like where were you for so long so that she can say that maybe she went to the market or she went to the friend's place etc so that she doesn't have to say like all of this be prepared that where she doesn't fumble and have to say that oh she went for a counseling or went to the say or uh, counseling center and that triggers further violence and to discuss also about some paperwork that she may take home like for example if we are giving her certain referrals or some resources like providing her with some pamphlets etc then how to take that home so that nobody else finds out so if the person probably has a phone then we can give uh, the numbers in the say, say, store the numbers in the phone with different names or if the person has a phone we can a click picture and put it in the phone rather than ha- having the paper in hand uh, of the like a picture of the pamphlet rather than having a, the pamphlet in hand and taking it home so these are things that we have to be very cautious about lastly we'll talk about the s part of lives model that is social support facilitation so here we have to help her identify her options so that can be her uh, so support system or social support so there he we have to identify that who are these people on whom she relies on or she trusts so these people can be from her family they can be her colleagues can be her friends can be her neighbors etc now in case she can't identify anybody who is from her informal network as her support system and basically she is not relying or being Uh, can't trust anybody from her informal network then in that case we'll have to connect her to various resources so maybe different helpline numbers support groups and also connecting to the oac so we'll briefly talk about what are the do's and don'ts of pfa so first the do's of pfa is we'll identify and inquire about the needs and concerns of the person and not assume what the person needs and decide on her behalf will respond to the emotional physical safety and support needs of the person we'll have to listen and validate the experiences and the concerns 
will help her feel connected to others, calm and hopeful, and will empower her to feel in charge and control. So we'll kind of try to develop an agency in her. What are the don'ts of PFA? We'll not try to solve her problem on her behalf. We'll just be giving a practical assistance. We'll try not to convince her to leave a violent relationship or to go to a police station or to the court or anything. We, that is not our, under our purview. We will not give her suggestions or uh, decisions on these grounds. Will not ask questions that force her to relieve the painful events, which is done in psychological debriefing. So we'll not make her go over or relieve the painful events. We'll not ask her to analyze what happened or why that happened or to in detail give the description of that incident. Again, we'll not make the person rework on the traumatic incident, which is again done in psychological debriefing and is not a part of psychological first aid. And we'll not pressurize her to tell her feelings and reactions to us. So let's revise the concepts of PFA once again. First of all, we have to listen to the client patiently in a very non-judgmental, empathetic, compassionate, and supportive way. We'll trust our, the client when she says that she faces severe danger. We have to trust the client, her emotions, her thoughts, etc. And we have to validate it at the same time. We have to ensure her safety and we have to link her to support services and connect to the resources. And we have to keep in mind that when we are making referrals, the referral should always be in accordance to her stated needs and not what we think is important or her needs are. Thank you.